pretty good. Uh, first, before we start, I want to introduce the other members of the committee that have pulled this together. So if you'd raise your hand so we can see you. Hagit Mano, okay. Abby Stern Cardinale, and Matt Hale. Back row. <laughs> All right. Um, we'd also like to thank the members of the borough staff that have been really terrific at pulling together this room and the technology and the publicity, and so we want to express that. The, the Civic Series came into being several months ago um, in response to what a number of us saw as this intense set of discussions and debates and controversies and all kinds of things from all parts of the, the uh, political spectrum um, that came out of the election in November. And so we began to say, what could we do about it? And we came up with uh, the idea of doing first the state. We talked to uh, Gail Mettler who said, why don't we make it a series? And so thank you, we got ambitious and we have, we're now making it a big uh, um, series. Um, so what we're gonna do tonight, as she said, is deal with the state government. Um, after that, we'll have a session on local government. Uh, the third will be on county government and we'll explain or explore what, what freeholders are, which is a, no other government in this country has freeholders. Um, uh, the session after that, we're going to zero in on what we've uh, sort of talked about as um, government as a team sport, which is namely how the state, the county, and local levels kind of fit together um, and work together. For our fifth session, we're going to move on to flashpoints in government, namely budgets and taxes. And uh, then last, our sixth and, and final session is going to be on the role that regular citizens can play in influencing the government. Um, the dates of the remaining sessions haven't yet been uh, created um, or scheduled. They're still in flux, but we'll be sending things out. That's why we've been asking for emails uh, and things like that. So for now, for tonight's program, I want to uh, introduce our speaker, Ingrid Reed, who is the retired head of the New Jersey Government Project at the Rutgers Eagleton Institute for Politics. Um, she's a long-term observer of state uh, politics, state government, and she's going to give us the big picture. Um, and the talk will cover topics like what's the distinctive nature of New Jersey in comparison to lots of other um, uh, states, why New Jersey is what's called a strong government, governor's state, how elections work, what's the role of political parties in New Jersey in comparison to other states. Uh, so I'll let her talk for herself. Let me introduce her, Ingrid Green. This one, yes. Uh, Hello everybody, I'm so delighted that you want to learn about New Jersey, New Jersey government, and I really should say, and politics up there, because the two are very closely knit in our state. Um, delighted to be here in Highland Park. Um, there are a lot of people who lived in Highland Park who I worked with, and um, I also was invited by the Senior Center to come here from time to time in the afternoon and talk about what's happening in politics in, in New Jersey. And so I, I'd first like to start off with, um, since I've worked in an institute that was founded, uh, uh, funded and founded by a woman, Florence Peshine Eagleton from Newark, um, I'd like to point out that uh, the beginnings of New Jersey, when they picked the seal, they picked two women. And, uh, and that seal has been our seal for um, since 1780 and um, the two women stand for liberty and prosperity. And I think that basically when all is said and done, that's what we still stand for. We want to be free and each individual respected, but we also want people to prosper and everyone to prosper. So I present that as kind of a byword for uh, thinking about New Jersey. Now, I'm gonna do my little PowerPoint and um, for those people who are under 25, please forgive me for the informal nature. For those who are over 55, 
I hope you'll think I was very clever to pull this off. And it's a kind of graphic novel approach where I drew the pictures and then scanned them and then figured out how to put them into a PowerPoint. But I didn't quite get all of them in, so you're not... <laughs> I had to bring a piece of paper to show that I was knew I was going to be in Highland Park and to tell you something about what other people look at in New Jersey about Highland Park. Uh, and to let, make the point that municipalities are totally the creature of the state. They can really only do what the state lets them do or watches them do. And, and with the Depression in the 30s, New Jersey has a very strong record of watching the way municipalities spend money because going bankrupt is not something that's permitted in New Jersey. So uh, uh, municipalities are important for lots of reasons, but that's one of the things that when you think of the state, that there uh, is a very strong uh, commitment to that. And so the other thing that people watch in this state is your population. And there are many places that are small, like you are, 15,000. But then the next thing they ask is, what's the breakdown? And by that, they mean how many Democrats and how many Republicans and how many unaffiliated voters are in this town. Because, of course, every uh, branch of government, local, county, uh, uh, and state, has a uh, parallel uh, political party function. So in, uh, in uh, Highland Park, 56% uh, uh, of the voters uh, are known as uh, affiliated with the Democratic Party. 8% are affiliated with the Republican Party. And, third, and therefore, 36% are known as unaffiliated. But that doesn't mean that you go around and raise your hand and say, I'm a Democrat. These numbers come from participation in primaries. So once you've voted in a primary, unless you decide to change, that's how this calculation comes about and how people watch the composition of municipalities and then make some very uh, strategic decisions about campaigning. So let me see if I get us to the next one. On the other hand, if you look at all of New Jersey, let's look at the big picture. We now have probably 9 million people. I keep thinking, weren't there four babies, six babies born, and only four people died, so we're now 9 million people. Um, but we have a very high percentage of our population that's registered to vote. As you can see, it's nearly 6 million. Uh, and then the breakdown of unaffiliated is closer uh, in, to being in balance than in Highland Park. Um, but uh, the uh, unaffiliated is still the largest group, but with Democrats uh, definitely uh, a much larger 15. It's been running about the same thing for a long time. Sort of 35% Democratic, 25% Republican, and then it goes up and down from time to time. And in the last election, you'll see the breakdown. And you may be new about that. Uh, that Hillary Clinton. Okay, so New Jersey is known as a blue state. And it's not just because of that breakdown of voters, but it, it's a calculation that's made of the governance of the state. And thinking about this election that's coming up, when you're going to be voting for members of the legislature, uh, uh, not for the congressional votes, you all know that, right? Uh, well, I'll just cover that. So it's only the legislature and the county and local government and in some municipalities, school board. But one of the reasons why we're known as a blue state is that the legislature is totally in the hands of the Democrats by quite a large margin. Uh, we're still known as a blue state even though our uh, governor is a Republican. Um, but our congressional delegation was half and half, six Republicans and six Democrats, until this past election, um, a, a very conservative uh, member of Congress was uh, defeated by a, uh, a Democrat. So it's now the balance that was uh, uh, in place in the last 10 years of one more seat um, for the Democrats than for the Republicans. Also, we have a track record of voting for uh, Democrats for president. It didn't always be that way, and uh, in fact, if you do the red and blue of uh, presidential elections and gubernatorial elections, it looks like a quilt. 
because it's sort of six terms of Republicans, six terms of, of uh, Democrats. But basically, that's um, uh, what the picture is in New Jersey today. And we'll have to see what happens after this next election. I suspect that New Jersey will probably always still be designated as a blue state because we don't have purple states uh, that would indicate that it's a mixed bag, so to speak. Okay. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we are not voting for anybody for the 6th Congressional District, which is yours. I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of this district. It looks like one of those examples of what you don't want to see in gerrymandering. <laughs> but doesn't it? It's very interesting. And of course, I've got Highland Park marked off up there in the, in the, in the middle section. <coughs> and you'll see that the breakdown for the district, as, uh, for the sixth district as a whole, is very similar to what you saw with Highland Park and better than. Um, uh, a, a, a more uh, better breakdown for uh, Democrats than um, uh, than the state as a whole. But um, uh, so this, this uh, district has been in the hands of Democrats. But now forget about that because you're not supposed to pay attention to congressional uh, elections. This has nothing to do with the federal government. Only New Jersey and Virginia are voting for statewide offices this year. So people will be watching us to see how we vote. So. Now, you are, I was gonna ask you, do you know the number of your legislative district? Because it's a, a little bit like what um, people say, when Jack Benny used to get together with his friends and so on, they, um, they'd start laughing and then somebody else would call out a number and somebody who didn't know what was going on said they'd gotten together for so many years that they don't have to tell the joke, they just have to call out the number. <laughs> so, so I always want people to tell me what's their district. And so how many of you knew it was 18? Well, pretty good, okay. Um, as you can see, it's a little strip that um, uh, goes down a certain part of basically uh, Middlesex County. But in a minute, you'll see that Middlesex County is chopped up into many pieces. So one of the things I think that is interesting um, about elections of this kind is that you are bound by geography. You live in New Jersey, so you can only vote for the governor that is running in the whole state. That's understood. But then you're bound by geography when it comes to the county. Nothing's going to change. Middlesex County will always be there, and you will have freeholders and find out what they do. But you'll be voting for them before you find out what they do, I'm not sure. <laughs> and, uh, and you will always be voting for people from Highland Park. And it is a place it's not going to change. On the other hand, the congressional district and the legislative district, you really have to pay attention. Because they change basically every uh, 10 years when the census is done so that those districts are the same across the country. Uh, I think I showed you on the congressional district that it's about 700,000 people. Uh, live in a congressional district, and so somehow you have to cobble the pieces together. It's one reason why the 6th District looks the way it does. And then here at the state level, it's about 200,000 people per district. So you've got to figure out how to do that. You try not to split uh, municipalities, but basically that's what this little configuration represents. And again, you'll see it has a very similar breakdown of um, voter affiliation as the other ones. You're getting the message here. This really is a democratic area. Okay. And finally, there's Middlesex County. By the way, it's not easy to find out who's running. If somebody here, one of the younger people, would tell me where they could find on the website who the freeholders, both Republican and freeholder candidates, are in Middlesex County now, where that's posted, I would be very happy to know that. Because one of the things I wanted to do was put up on this board, um, on, the, on the website, on the PowerPoint, who the, the names of the people who were running. And there is no place to really find the ballot. To find who's running for the legislature is not easy going into the division of elections. So one of the things, if you want good government, it should be much easier to find out who's running for office. And in this day and age, 
where um, you, know, you can Google things. You cannot Google that because the Division of Elections website is not Googleable. <laughs> and that's, and I'm making that up, maybe that is a term. But um, anyway, keep that in mind, all right? So, um, you will see uh, here, Middlesex County has all these numbers. And there's the 18th, where you are, but you'll see how <coughs> it's carved up so that it is pieces of other districts. Uh, and that gets to be an interesting issue when we start thinking about the role of political parties to endorse candidates. Your political party here, the Democrats or the Republicans, in effect has to pay attention to more than its own county uh, to endorse candidates that are representing part of the county. There are some counties, uh, like Hunterton, where um, the, you don't have to worry about any other county because you're not cobbled together with another county. So that if you're endorsing candidates in Middlesex County, you are having a lot of different meetings. And you're uh, forming alliances and treaties and so on about who you're going to support because you have to do it together with the other counties. We could have a much more complicated com uh, map up here if we um, uh, looked at where the other parts of the, what, the 14th, for example, where I used to live, um, uh, were up there. Uh, so, so the whole legislative uh, uh, situation gets affected by the way uh, the, the districts are divided up. And somehow Middlesex County was not able to make a really good case for itself the last time we did redistricting that it should be more cohesive. Okay. Now, not every election is the same. Different people participate in different elections. This little graph shows you that for the presidential election, 68% of people turned out. The last time when the legislature was at the top of the ticket, because we vote for the legislature every two years, we vote for the Senate in New Jersey that, uh, every four years. Um, when the, the legislature here was at the top of the ticket, it was a 22% turnout. And the last Republican election, um, it says 40 there, but for as long as I've heard, it was 38%. And that was Christie's second term, and you may recall that he um, called a special election in October so we could elect a, a senator. So people were voting once in October and then in November, and Democrats did not support their candidate in any kind of an energetic way. So the turnout was really 38%. Now, the real challenge is, can you all get people to turn out to vote so we can get that turnout back up to 50%? But the fact that there is a different electorate for every election means that there's a different strategy for campaigning, can different candidates even are selected for uh, because of who's going to be turning out. And people who know this, this formula very well will take this into consideration. What is this election like? Okay, who's going to be turning out? And as you can imagine, it's really the party faithful who turn out. But that's not who you really want to be the only people turning out, right? You want people maybe to be judging which candidate they really want to vote for uh, and paying attention rather than being rather wrote, vote, wrote about the vote. <laughs> okay. So the challenge is, I think this year, can we get the turnout back up again? Can we get at least 45%, if not 50, turnout? And I think with all the work that you're doing and resist and so on, maybe that will happen. Okay. So if you're voting for a legislator, you know there are two assembly people for every district and one senator, right? Senator every four years, uh, legislator, uh, assemblyman uh, every two years. Uh, they get paid $49,000. They get $100,000 for their staff and their office. But they are not alone. <laughs> uh, 
they have a lot of services. One is the nonpartisan Office of Legislative Services, which is a really reformed and a very empowering office in New Jersey. The legislature really had no assistance uh, until around after the war when the Office of Legislative Services was established to be the sort of intellectual research arm of the legislature. And if you talk to your legislator about a bill that he or she is supporting, you can be sure that it's the Office of Legislative Services that did the research and actually wrote the bill. Okay? But the legislator also has the resources of the partisan staff. If you go down to the State House, the back of the State House, the beautiful quarters that were built about 25 years ago, so that each party uh, has wonderful accommodations and now a, a, a significant amount of staff. In fact, the governor, when we had a very tight budget, one of the areas where he um, permitted there to be an increase was for the partisan staff, both Democratic and Republican, of course. But that's a very important um, part of being a legislator, that you know that if you have an idea, you can go someplace and get the assistance you need to develop it into a bill. But you also know that you have to go back to your caucus and, um, and get the support of your own Democratic or Republican uh, uh, staff and um, colleagues. Uh, and then there's a majority of the minority caucuses and they have beautiful caucus rooms. Go to the State House sometime, take the tour, and you'll get a real picture of how this physical arrangement uh, works. So if you're a legislator, you're not alone. And you might want to think about that with the final um, word, uh, find out what committee the legislator is on, because that's very important. Any bill has to get through the committee to which it's assigned, very similar to the federal government. So if you want to know if somebody's running and if you should support that person, one of the things you might ask about is uh, what committee is he or she on, what have they done, what are the problems, how have they gotten Republican support or Democrats, uh, vice versa. Uh, so the legislator is not alone, just remember that. Okay, here we come to our our powerful governor. Um, I'm going to do a little informal history of New Jersey, but I will tell you that I think about the governor that on September 10th, it was the 70th anniversary of New Jersey's new constitution. New, modern, up-to-date, relevant, well thought out constitution. And they met for the last time on September 10th and adopted it in the Rutgers gym. And they met three months. Delegates selected from every county. And this is a really big thing in New Jersey. Now, 70 years sounds like a long time um, if you're young. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a real breakthrough. And the real breakthrough was to say, New Jersey has to be run in a professional way. The governor had been, at that, before this, elected only for a three-year term and could not run again, and had very limited powers. The legislature was much more in charge, and the whole judicial system was basically decentralized to counties. So as a result of the post-war period, of the war period, when New Jersey really wasn't prepared to be a modern state, there was uh, a lot of effort, Republican and Democrat, to uh, uh, change that. They tried several times and finally made it in 1947, September 10th. So what they did was they established a very powerful uh, governor because they wanted the state to be run, maybe not like a corporation, but somebody in charge. We have only one office in New Jersey, Lieutenant Governor, which we now have, this is our first run through with Lieutenant Governor, doesn't count because it's like the Vice President of the United States, totally beholden to the number one person. So we only vote for one person statewide to be in charge of our government. Practically every other state 
has other people running for state offices. And so the governor could be Democratic, but the uh, statewide elected superintendent could be a Republican. Secretary of State is very often uh, an elected position. Attorney General is very often an elected position. In New Jersey, one person. And that person has a lot of responsibility, including making incredible number of appointments. He or she is basically in charge of everything. Now, so far, I haven't mentioned the judicial, um, uh, part, the third part of government. Um, it was reformed in this constitutional convention. Uh, we have a very good reputation of appointing very good people to be judges, and so New Jersey is looked up as a state that really knows how to have a good, in effect, Supreme Court. And over the years, um, the including making incredible number of appointments. He or she is basically in charge of everything. Now, so far, I haven't mentioned the judicial, um, uh, part, the third part of government. Um, it was reformed in this constitutional convention. Uh, we have a very good reputation of appointing very good people to be judges, and so New Jersey is looked up as a state that really knows how to have a good, in effect, Supreme Court. And over the years, um, the whole administration of, um, of, of, of justice in New Jersey has maintained a very high quality and with a lot of respect for good management. They were the first to use computers, and uh, I think that you know, right now you don't have to worry about that part. You might have to worry about other parts of New Jersey. Uh, but the governor does appoint them with the, um, the approval of the Senate. Um, but he appoints uh, prosecutors in the 21 uh, counties. There are 52 authorities to which he appoints members, and he gets to uh, approve the minutes. And if he doesn't approve the minutes, the action it is no. Um, he has 20 cabinet members, limited cabinet. He cannot appoint more. He cannot create but create more cabinet positions. That's another reform that you have a limited number of people taking responsibility uh, for running state government and other things. The other part of his or her power is the veto. And veto legislation. I've seen bills get through the legislature, work very hard for three years. They get on the governor's desk. They can sit there for up to 45 days and then the governor can simply veto it. Or he can uh, veto it with a, a conditionally and change the wording so that it's very different from what the legislature adopted. And then you have to decide if, if you want to start all over again. Total veto. He can do a line item veto of any item in the budget. A budget that is put together with his estimate of the revenue the budget is introduced through the assembly um, of how to spend it, but it's the governor who calls the shots on how much he thinks will be coming into the budget. Which, of course, if you think about um, what that means, the legislature is told either there's a lot of money or a little money that has a big impact on the budget. So that is a very powerful role in New Jersey. He, re he or she receives $175,000. Uh, salary and then has a, 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 a very good um, sum of money for a, a staff in, in the state house. Uh, but I don't think it's seen as out of line. I've never heard anybody say that the, the governor shouldn't have that uh, much in terms of staff. So that's, um, keep that in mind when you're thinking about who you want to be our next governor. Uh, this person's got to be wise, got to be strategic, and uh, we hope um, balanced. And so here are the people who are running for governor. I'm just putting this up on the screen because you really should get used to it. They're the two that you've heard of, Ken Rudano and Bill Murphy, who come through their respective parties. But you have one person from Highland Park uh, representing the Green Party, and then you have is uh, Gina Genovese, who's a very interesting person who spent, I think, the last seven years of her um, uh, career as a public servant. She was a mayor in Long Valley, I believe, um, advocating for consolidation and um, uh, what else? Um, shared services. 
and thinks that that's and is running under the slogan reduce property taxes. And then uh, usually there is a libertarian candidate and a constitutional party candidate. The others who were not Republicans and Democrats were not running in the primary because the only two parties that have been in effect approved because of the number of votes that they've gotten to have a primary are the Republicans and the Democrats. The Greens were hoping that they could get there at some point, but not yet. And then the last person has filed a petition, but so far nobody's been able to find out anything about that person. But there are the, the choices, and we'll say a little bit more about that. Okay. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is the only thing that looks complicated, and you shouldn't even read it. But um, it's something that we've been using at the Ready to Run program at Rutgers, where we've gotten a lot of women interested in how government works. And basically what it conveys is uh, that we have the elected positions that you see over there. But for every position, New Jersey is organized with political party committees. And uh, the elected positions have no relationship to each other. The only thing we're, the, the only position that we have elections for uh, is school board, and that has always been nonpartisan. I think maybe you've noticed that since school board elections now take place in November, that they're usually at the bottom of the ballot, completely apart from the partisan part of the ballot. So um, uh, uh, there, there's no connection. If you run for council or freeholder, there's no automatic way that you sort of work your way up. Each decision is a separate one. On the other hand, the way the party structure is set up, and this is by law, we taxpayers, in effect, have paid the legislature to create laws that govern how political parties work. And of course, we pay for the primary, which is there really to give parties uh, an opportunity to choose who they want to rep represent the party. And that's paid for just as much a general election because it's an ass it's assumed that that's good for democracy, and you, we can have that discussion some other time. But it is a part of government in New Jersey to regulate how parties work. And in this case, you may here in Highland Park be smart about uh, the district committee men and women that are elected at every election district, either Republican or Democrat. And in that case, once you're elected there you become a member of the party's municipal committee in the, in the town and as the county committee where endorsements are made and then from that group there's a state committee that has the powers of um, running campaigns and the, the political parties um, have the, the exquisite power of having the largest contribution limit uh, if you're making uh, contributions to parties of $35,000. Other um, uh, party contributions are much less than $100,000, so we won't go into that now. But I just wanted you to know that when we talk to people about running for office, they say, you have to understand how this works. Parties are very important, and uh, they're important informally, but also they have a part of the structure of our government. And that could be discussed more. Okay, here's a little digression. You have to know a little bit about the history of New Jersey to understand how we do the things that we do. So if you will indulge me, um, maybe make this seven minutes. Let me go back to the fact that what I have up here are several pieces that you need to know about. Okay. This line is called the province line. Okay, got that? And this line right here is the main across New Jersey. The Indians used it, it's 27 for Route 1, it's that area. Water flows on this side to the Atlantic, on this side to Delaware, so it's the high point, okay? And it links the two best ports in New Jersey, New Brunswick to Trenton, okay? So that's the geography, and the province line was created by an English king who didn't really care a whiff about New Jersey. Because New Jersey really wasn't worth anything 
It was between a really great harbor with a great organizer, Peter Stuyvesant, and it was controlled by the Dutch until the British took over. And so that was a great place. Everybody came in in New York, okay? That wasn't in New Jersey. That wasn't in this piece that uh, land. And then William Penn, also a great organizer, entrepreneur, really knew how to run things, and the great port of Philadelphia. So, you know, there was really not much in New Jersey. So the king gave half of New Jersey to one guy and half to another guy. And for a while, New Jersey was East and West Jersey with one capital in Perth Amboy and another capital in Burlington. And the two of them weren't very smart to begin with, and so who was going to get together for what reason? Because at the, in, in the old days, it was all sailing and setting into port. And if you look at the little boats that I have here, that's what they're around here, maybe you can't see it. New Jersey really didn't have any other ports. You could set in and have a little port, like Port Norris on the Delaware Bay, but there wasn't any other place where you could have anything larger than a little town. But what else did New Jersey have? You had to cross New Jersey to get anywhere. So how did you do that? On a stagecoach. How often did the stagecoach stop? Every six or seven miles. How many places do we have little towns? Every six or seven miles, <laughs> right? Okay, so there you had some centers that formed for commerce, all right? Houses close to each other, a bank, and so on. And then you had farms around it. Well, the farmers that were around it in the townships really didn't have much in common with the people who were in the boroughs. Like, I lived in Princeton Borough for many years, but even if you think about Highland Park, you're, you're a little borough, right? You were a little town, you were part of the crossroads. You were very close to a really big place where the ships came in New Brunswick, all right? So, <clears throat> New Jersey grew as a place where there was enough commerce where you could ask somebody to pay for government on the basis of the land that they owned. And it was men who had them. So there was a little kitty in these boroughs. And the farmers said, well, you know, we don't want to pay you or so on. But then they had the problem of school kids. So rather than forming a part of government to take care of the kids, they gave the money to some teachers to set up some schools. So the government wasn't taking responsibility, and that's how we sort of got school districts. And sometimes the school districts were set up by a number of people collecting money and giving it to one school system. But basically, the little towns really didn't want to do very much. And then they found out that they had another problem, and that was, who was going to be in charge of getting from one town to the other? Who was going to take those roads? Who was going to take care of the drainage? And then they had another problem. What were they going to do about the bad people? Nobody wanted a prison, right? And what do you do about the poor people? Because there had to be poor houses. So gradually they figured out that if the towns got together and gave that responsibility to a larger area, which they happened to call counties, and where there were freeholders, and I won't tip off the freeholder thing. Um, and that's basically the structure of government that we have today, right? Does that seem very familiar to you? Local support for your own citizens and to find your own community. A little bit larger for things that most people don't even know about but take for granted. The roads, the courthouses, the jails, right? And, um, and nobody really had any sense of the state. The first, that sort of came into being when we picked those two women to be our emblem. But also, obviously at the time our nation was forming, New Jersey was the second state to join the Union. It had five people sign the Declaration of Independence. So there was communication and we began to think about ourselves as a, as a state, but we weren't a very wealthy state to begin with. So, um, so where do we get our money? Well, the whole transportation stuff really became big when the railroads came in. So, I've always been fascinated by this. Here are the railroads of 1840. Okay? So somebody figured out that the railroads had money and they were crossing those counties. And the county leaders started taxing the railroads and also got together statewide so that for a very long time, the railroads paid for state government. Okay? And, uh, and then some other fees were 
um, set into place. There were also canals. But basically, until 1947, and even later than that, New Jersey had no way of getting everybody to pay for state government. And it was really in the hands of county bosses uh, that basically ran getting the money out of the railroads. And in case you're interested, I'll have this map. This is what it looks like today. <laughs> and we have the turnpike, right? Nice cash cow. All right. So that takes us to the question of, so where do we get our money today? Because following the new constitution, it was not much longer that uh, uh, 12, 13 years that the real question arose, how are we gonna pay for the state? And the first thing we decided was to have a sales tax. And then it wasn't until 76 in the Byrne administration when we realized that the big that we, that industry had come to New Jersey, the big cities were, were failing, and the arrangement that we had long, long ago of everybody paying for your kids at the local level was really not good for the state and it wasn't good for the kids. So it wasn't until 76 that we had an income tax. But of course, the burden of providing services was getting larger at the lower level, at the local level. So we now have a system where the state has various uh, sources of revenue. And these are the main four. Now, I haven't told you which little space is which, so who would like to guess which one is the income tax? One, or which one is the sales tax that generates what amount of money for the state? Anybody want to guess? Well, if you don't want to, then show you. <laughs> Income tax provides 41%. Uh, and we have a, 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 a total kitty of about $35 billion. Um, the sales tax is 27%. Corporate has always been low, corporate business tax. And then we have other income. There are many different ways uh, that you get money, casino with fees and so on. Um, so that's what New Jersey has today. But the bargain when they um, generated the sales tax and the income tax was that it would be turned back to the towns, the municipalities, for property tax relief. Okay. So where do you see 41% for income tax and 27% for sales tax, the state's just holding that money. And a big job for any elected official is to decide how to allocate funds. Just think about it. What, what does your town council do? Basically, when all is said and done, it may have a policy or a rulemaking piece behind it, but basically, you're collecting money and you are deciding how it should be spent. And the state has very little uh, leeway because the agreement was that this all goes back. It goes back to the counties and it goes back to the municipalities. And to this day, in this election, the big question is, how do you decide what goes where? How do you allocate this largesse? Okay. So right now, our expenses are of this kind. Now, it's a little hard because the definition of state aid, which is the, oh, I won't ask you to guess. Okay, 42% state aid. That's basically what goes back to the municipalities. Currently, the budget for uh, supporting education in the state is 14 billion. All right, and we have a significant amount of money, most of medical, a lot of medical expenses and, and for families and welfare and so on is the next one of grant support. It happens to also include higher education. Then we have debt payment, and as you know, that's a big problem. That piece is getting larger. And then for running state government and all of those 20 cabinet positions, it's less than 20% of what we take in. I mean, state, all the things that happen in state government are a relatively small part of our budget. Well, there are a couple of things that aren't on here. Very good question. 
One, one is the special transportation fund, which we should have probably a little engine that people are pouring money into it and they'll be, be going out. So that's that's one of the pieces. And um, well, pensions are in here. Well, the money wasn't put into the fund. I mean, that is a very big piece of, because that goes to how do you support your state government with employees? You, you hire people and give them um, a, a promise. But also you have new employees who are coming in and health care is of a very different um, um, cost and process than it used to be. So you may have to change that with new employees. That's a big question. Um, so that's what's confronting uh, the state. And, um, and there's one other part that I was going to say. Oh, I know. So, okay. I didn't make a slide for this. I mean, I, I tried. This is what it would look like. But I couldn't figure out how to get it into there today. I forgot that part of it. I had to insert something new. So now somebody has to say, well, what about property taxes? Okay. okay. I have a $35 billion budget plus paying gasoline taxes, right, to go in the special transportation trust fund that only supports, oh, it's an, all the uh, turnpike, very profitable area. Okay, here, that's the new slide. If you put all the property taxes together of everybody, okay, in the state, it comes to $28 billion plus another 10 billion of all kinds of fees that are collected at the local level and then turned into um, oh. revenue, okay? And so what do we do with that? Well, as you know, between 40 and 60%, depending on where you are, goes for education. And then the municipal budgets are around 20% and the counties are about 11 to 13%. Because the counties don't collect any money. But you all pay at the local level, and then it gets shipped up to the counties, OK? So you put the two things together, and you know what do you come up with? About $65 billion in New Jersey is spent on our collective community. And how that money is spent, how it, how it is raised, and how it is spent, and the rules that go along with it is what every elected official is faced with doing. That's what the job is, basically, when all said and done. I mean, you can have all kinds of policies of, um, you know, do we have legalized marijuana? Well, that's a cost for managing it, but it's also a revenue source, and uh, what kind of, what is fair, who should get it? Uh, there's nothing that they will be deciding for you that doesn't have that component of how do you spend resources and what are the rules that go along with doing it. All right, so that's the challenge in this election. Now, I just wanted to say something about elections that people uh, don't think of very often because we complain, we complain a lot. First of all, we have very old election machines and our election machines have no way of um, having redundancy, as they say. If something goes wrong, there's no way that we can figure out what the vote should have been because we don't have a paper trail. And um, New Jersey is about the last state to have faced that. Even New York City is in better shape than, uh, than we are, and that took a long time to do it. So that's one of the things that you might listen to. And people have estimated that the cost of new machines is about the cost of the special election that uh, Governor Christie called in October. So uh, keep that in mind. But New Jersey has a very fine, uh, what they call election law enforcement commission that um, governs the rules for how much money you can give to candidates and how candidates can spend it. And like our Supreme Court, it has managed to be a very respected organization, somewhat bureaucratic, but you can find out who's giving money to any candidate that you want to now online in an improved uh, website. But uh, it has maintained its independence, and believe me, this doesn't happen in many states, and New Jersey is seen as a model, something that we can be very proud of. Also, we have public funding for gubernatorial races, and you may have read about that. It's not perfect, 
but it makes a big difference for candidates to be able to aspire to be a governor if you're not wealthy. And uh, it means you limit your spending, but you have to raise a certain amount of money before you can get the money. And it means that money is part of the debate, too. It's not just the money. It's the way we think about campaigns. It also requires candidates to debate, and to debate in a respectful way because it's sort of managed. You can't really fool around with it. You have to, you have to agree to debate, which candidates don't like to do. Um, but um, they'll be coming up, and also the candidates are required to have a statement. Uh, you might think it's a hokey statement, but they have to have a statement of what they think the voters want to know, and that's all required. And it's not something that you see very often in, in other states. The other thing is we've had, had a little comment about districts and redistricting. Um, in, in New Jersey, it's not done by the legislature per se, as the way we've been hearing about the Supreme Court uh, having a, um, a case about Wisconsin and reading a lot about the legislatures in the red states that seem to have been drawing districts that favor them. In New Jersey, uh, there's a separate commission for legislative districts and a separate commission for congressional districts. They could be improved, but we in New Jersey have had now 40 years of some experience with having districts drawn by a separate commission. And as I say, I'd be the last person to tell you, I mean, first person to tell I would be the first person to tell you, but it's not really a perfect system. But it is much better than leaving it in the hands of the legislature. And so it's just another way that New Jersey, in effect, was forced into it because there were some cases that called on the way we had been doing it before. The other thing is that we, uh, um, we do have sample ballots in New Jersey. That's not the case in, in all um, districts. And we have, um, uh, we don't have same day res um, registration, but we do have now a much more open system of using the mail for voting. And so I'd just like to point that out because lots of times you hear about all the things that are bad about New Jersey. But to me, it says there is a kernel of reform. There is reason to hope that people really push that something uh, uh, can happen, and that we should be proud of what we have. So that's um, that. Watch those voting machines. <laughs> and finally, there's not going to be um, the end here. This is the end. I just thought what I would put up here is I've been watching, and I'm going to be running a discussion series at the Princeton <coughs> Library for five weeks from 5 to 6 in the afternoon on Mondays on issues in the campaign. We're posting, uh, for example, the first one is fiscal. We're going to have what the Chamber of Commerce and the New Jersey Business and Industry Association wants to have happen, as well as the Fund for New Jersey and so on. But uh, I've made a list of the, of the real challenges that involve resources and rules. Uh, education funding formula that we mentioned. How are we going to get have that money go out the door, and where, and how much? Uh, housing policy. It's not just affordable housing. This is a much bigger issue of what municipalities should be responsible for. The pension funding. What do we do in the future? What do we do about people who have been promised their pensions? Tax policy. How do we uh, decide how we're going to um, uh, raise our taxes? Transportation. What's going? To, the big question will be: How should we balance the, the use of that fund so that we're fixing both public transportation and roads, and not just say transportation, because it's much more complex than that. In New Jersey, has more commute commuters, except for New York City, using public transportation to get to work. So it's, a, it's an economic development issue as well. We, what about our air, water, and we now know a lot more about what's wrong with our water supply, and uh, also climate change, resiliency, and then finally, health care. And for New Jersey, this is a very big financial issue because if the, the federal government decides to cut Medicaid, that means we only have 50% of the money that we would be spending on helping uh, poor people uh, get health care children uh, because of New Jersey having agreed to take Medicare 
for um, implementing um, of, in effect, Obamacare. And so you have to watch that one. That is a very big issue. If that comes out of our budget, it's in that grants part, the 27%, we are really in trouble. So that's what you have to look forward to. And uh, as I say, this is not the end. It's really the beginning, because you have to vote in November. <laughs> for questions from the floor. I thought I'd just throw out one just to find the pump and then uh, everybody can uh, uh, jump in after that. And that's, how different is New Jersey in terms of the involvement of political parties in an official way in government policy making activities? Are other states less, have less political amount or how does it, how does it work? Um, I, there's lots of ways to answer that, but I think that the states that are older and have gone that have gone through the industrial revolution and the way and the involve the, the evolving role of of political bosses like New York and Massachusetts, the, the eastern coast and and uh, um, the parties are stronger. Maybe even in the Middle West. Uh, uh, some states that weren't have been learning how to make parties stronger, like the, the use of redistricting in, in the legislature. But it's really in the more western, as you move west, uh, the parties are not quite as strong. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. The parties are strong in the United States. We've decided that that's the basis, in effect, for our democracy. And um, not having a parliamentary system where we have a number of parties we can choose from and where the lines are a little bit more permeable so you can sort of move around and you have to have a much more of a, um, a, a I'll trade with you so you have to respect the other party more. Um, we, we are a partisan state. Would you say that, Matt, basically? I mean, a country? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, compared to the to the rest of the world, I would say certainly that, it, that parties are a lot more important in America than they are in, in most of the world. And the fact that we have two is, is the fundamental part. There's yeah. parties all over the world that we, we focus on two parties. But I think the, the, the lesson for this is to understand that they are and not to back away from it. I mean, you have to participate. And um, I, I thought it was very interesting in this latest um, uh, primary election. Uh, back in the Bill Bradley days, maybe you remember be, uh, Bill Bradley ran for the Senate and, in a primary that was very active and Dick Leone challenged him and there were different party leaders who supported each of them. It was a very um, energetic election. And then we sort of moved away from that so that we didn't have strong candidates vying in a primary. We had some people vying, but one was clearly not anywhere near as strong as the other. In this election, we had people who were fit for office, who had experience, who organized at the local level. And even though they didn't win, uh, Jack Ciccarelli got a lot of support that we haven't seen in the last sort of 25 years. And the same with uh, uh, John Wisniewski and um, what was it, uh, Johnson, Jim Johnson. Uh, you know, getting 20% of the vote by starting out only five months before the election and, uh, and getting support across the state and raising money, that was very healthy. Uh, and I, I don't know if the party bosses noticed um, but I suspect that, um, but that's the kind of thing we should encourage. That's what primaries are all about. And, and this whole business, I don't want to get into this, the, 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 the line uh, of a, bar, a party boss coming out and supporting a certain person uh, in the election is not the way that was supposed to work. Uh, those the counties that decide that they're going to have an endorsement through a party convention now really have to do that right. They have to have bylaws, they have to have secret ballots and so on, but it's still left up to the parties to decide whether they want to do it that way. And I think if there was something that really should be discussed is really what is the role of the party in the primary. And, um, uh, and should 
a self-anointed, not a self-anointed person, that's not the way it really works, but uh, you know, somebody who everybody gets around to say, yeah, this is the guy who's going to be in charge. Uh, is, is that really the way you want endorsements to take place? I, I can speak from here. Um, given that you're describing New Jersey as a very strong governor state, does that essentially mean that if you don't have the endorsement of the governor for a given policy initiative, it's essentially dead? Or are there ways of working around that where if the governor isn't necessarily utterly opposed but maybe indifferent, there are ways of working through the legislature? I guess I'm trying to get a sense of if you're a group trying to influence politics in the state, to what degree is you win or lose just based on whether or not you have the governor supporting that policy or not? That's a pretty good description because the governor has to sign the bill. The governor has to sign the bill. I mean, it's a little bit like the federal system. I mean, we're not that different from the federal system where the committee system is very strong. If you can't get it out of the committee, you can't go to the caucus, you can't get posted by the party leader. And uh, then even if both parties in both houses, it has to go from one house to the other. I mean, it's really complicated. You really wonder, how does anything ever get done? When, when I described this, I did a, a class where they said, well, tell us how it works. So I had um, a woman come in from the AARP to describe how they got the, um, uh, the care bill through, um, where it requires hospitals now to have a, a procedure to sit with a person that's leaving the hospital as well as a designated care giver to go over a, a protocol of what's going to happen when you leave the hospital. To get that done, uh, and and what committee went to, and then we shuttled to another committee in the Senate, and so on. The, the hospitals weighed in, the doctors weighed in, and so on. Um, it, it really is amazing that anything gets um, done that isn't just sort of apple pie. But the governor still has to sign the bill. Hmm. He's very powerful. She is very powerful. On the other hand, you know, the legislature can screw things up that the, the governor wants. They cannot act on something uh, that, because you can't do things without having uh, the legislature, have, with most things, have uh, pass a bill. I mean, it's a little bit, if you think of what Obama did with executive orders, you can do a certain amount of that, but it really doesn't stick. And so uh, the governor also is beholden for some of the things that uh, he or she might want to do with the legislature, and the legislature can sit on their hand and they're not interested in that. And that has happened. You know, that's what government is all about. We don't want people making decisions quickly and not giving people a say, and lots of times things go very quickly that I don't think are really in the best interest of the public in terms of visibility and participation. I mean, I, 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 the, the number of times that, that committees are voting a bill out of the committee that nobody's ever seen, uh, I think is a, it always shocks me. Yes. Is there an example of a state that you would characterize as having a weak governor? Well, um, weak governors are usually ones where the, uh, they don't have all of the power. In other words, where you have an attorney general. Uh, where if education is in the hands of an elected superintendent of schools, of, of the state schools, uh, where you don't have um, uh, the, the power that the governor has in New Jersey to do line item vetoes, where you just have to take the budget the way it comes, where you don't get to say how much, uh, uh, set the revenue um, um, estimate. Um, in uh, North Carolina, this election, when the Democrat defeated just very narrowly the Republican, then this, the legislature went to take power away from the governor. So it didn't stand up in court, but that would have been a way to do that, to create a weak governor. In that case. Yeah. And in New Jersey, we have a, a relatively uh, short constitution, but a, a very specific one, sort of very practically oriented. So a lot of these things are in the constitution, and um, if you're really watching, and people do watch, um, you really couldn't change this the way they did in North Carolina without changing the constitution, and then that's pretty formidable. Yes, Matt? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that the 
I, my memory is that there's only three states in the country that have line item. The governor has line item. Oh, really? And there's no state in the country where the governor has a minute, um, the ability to, to veto minutes of agency um, oh. records, which means that they don't have it. They so can't do put it in one perspective. <laughs> There's no state that has the ability to, to essentially negate a, um, an agency report just by vetoing the minutes of the report. Mm -hmm. And I think there's only three states that have the line of veto. But in New Jersey, you can veto the minutes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it seems to me that the political news reporting is on life support in New Jersey mm -hmm. as the press declines, and I'd, I'd love to hear your comments on what the effects of that have been. Uh, <laughs> uh, my former colleague, Matt Hale, who you're lucky to have living in this town, has been studying that. I, I think that we don't really know because where people get their news and media uh, is, is so different now than it was with, with newspapers. But um, I'm connected with um, a uh, online journalism site, um, um, www.njspotlight.com, and a, a lot of people are getting some really solid information about government from that. Uh, I think the problem really is that um, uh, even if you had more newspapers doing a really great job, as I think the like the New York Times is and the Washington Post is, and actually I'm I'm very um, pleased with NJTV and with uh, uh, NJ.com uh, of uh, holding politicians accountable. And uh, um, I mean, there are a lot there are a lot of things that you don't read in the newspapers, but it's really very hard to cover everything. But given the decline of the the general field of of, um, of, of journalism. Uh, I think it's still worth watching TV and reading a newspaper, and especially going to NJ Spotlight. Uh, and um, and there there also are some other um, political sites that I think do a, a pretty good job. But um, uh, I think under the circumstances, New Jersey may be better off than some other places. Would you say that from your studies, Matt? Um. In some, New Jersey has an excellent local news history and tradition, and there's there's hyper local sites. There's New Brunswick Today, and there's the Highland Park Planet was one. For, so those are growing as well. There's a lot of really high quality journals. NJ Spotlight is one of the best um, uh, state news sites in, in the entire country. Um, Insider NJ Observer. There's a number of these sort of blogs that are, are very good. So on the quality of New Jersey journalism, I, I would say we're as good, if not better, than most places. But the problem is, is New Jersey has the same number of television stations licensed in New Jersey to cover New Jersey as North Platte, Nebraska. <laughs> right? They have 25,000 people and we have 9 million. So, and that's because we're so close. The, the history one that you showed was so fascinating because we were divided between New York and Philadelphia. Yeah. Our media markets are divided between North New York and Philadelphia. And so all of the, the television, the, the vast majority, I mean, we have NJTV, which is an excellent source for news. News 12 is an excellent source for news. But when you look at the number of people who, who watch those, it's absolutely minuscule compared to the people that watch the worst news in New York and the worst news in Philadelphia. Their ratings are so much higher because it's ABC, NBC, CBS, um, all of those that lead into the to the programs that you want to watch it, you know, after the local news is done. So we have great sources of local news, but we don't have the broadcast news that that will reach most people. And we don't have um, radio. We problem. don't have radio in a in a, uh, a state where a lot of people are in their cars a lot of the time. And we sold those stations uh, in this dichotomy of Philadelphia and New York rather than saying how do we have a statewide system. I mean with very little money, we're, we're getting money from the broadband sale and that money could be used to build better transmitters so that we could have one system in New Jersey of radio. Yeah. Um, and and WNYC and, um, and WHYY 
they covered New Jersey, but that's not their main emphasis. And you could just imagine what kind of fun you could have if you had one radio system in New Jersey, which is a lot cheaper than, uh, than having a TV system, but we don't. Our governor sold it. So. Yes. How has, in recent years, the sources of revenue changed and the total amount of revenue changed? And if, if one wanted to see, say, state revenue increase, uh, what, what, what are the prospects for that or sources of revenue? Yeah, uh, actually, New Jersey has had a pretty even progression of increase in its total state uh, budget. Uh, we had, we've had some periods of time where it's gone up quite a bit, but um, the, the real question, and uh, uh, a man named Peter Reinhardt, who also is a person who's been uh, working on NJ Spotlight, and um, uh, just wrote a piece saying, you know, we have to take a break and really look at the tax structure and uh, do this in a very thoughtful way and say, are we taxing the things that we should be taxing? Because this is now 40 years since we had a, a, a tax policy session in 85, which resulted in the support for the state judicial system um, uh, being uh, 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 put together and, and um, uh, uh, organized in a different way than at the county level and then paying for it at the state level. Um, but we haven't done anything like that. Uh, and, and we probably, it's, it, we, I mean, people, if, if, let me put it this way, if, uh, uh, if uh, Bill Murphy gets elected, we probably will be taxing higher income people. Uh, probably not in just one increment, but there'd be different increments for up to a million and a million two and then over two. And, and that would make a difference, but it wouldn't re, uh, produce that much more um, money. And um, uh, so uh, New, New Jersey is really in a tight spot. I mean, we have a lot of debt, as you know, and, um, and I don't know if people will have the patience to really say, let's take a hard look at this. I mean, when I was thinking about the Constitutional Convention and that they met for three months and really negotiated and hammered out what they wanted this new constitution to be, that's basically what we probably should be doing about tax policy. Uh, where are we raising the money and where is it, uh, it going? And, um, uh, you know, our, our school funding uh, has changed over the years. It, it takes into consideration the wealth of a community um, income, uh, not just what's generated from property taxes, and, uh, and, and we've been able to deal with that. We've looked at, at places where um, the burden on the school system is more because of non-English speaking um, people. We've dealt with special, special education. So as a state, we're capable of, of doing more fine-grained uh, uh, effort at, at defining what the problems are and how we're supposed to send mon spend money. I'm just not sure that, uh, look how long it took us to get a gas tax. I mean, is there anything that you know of that you bought 23 years ago or a roof that you put on your house that you didn't think year after year, I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to replace that or how I'm going to put more money into it. And for the state to go for 23 years without ever increasing the gas tax, I mean, that is, and, and leaving things to be, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, so you can't deal with that. And there have been like four blue ribbon commissions that have said how that should be done. Um, I, I don't know if, if we can get out of this uh, if, uh, in a way that really makes sense. If we don't tax services in a lot of places, what about internet sales and so on? I'm not saying that we know exactly how to do that, but that's the kind of thing where you do some research and you negotiate for how you're going to make that work. And I, I hope we're losing some very good people from the legislature who are thoughtful people and could have taken a leadership role in that. And we're getting new people coming in. And you know, it's good to have new people sort of get into the mix. But I also fear that we're, we're losing, it's going to take us some time to develop some of the leadership that is, was respected and could have pulled something like that off if they wanted to. Can you explain? Um, what led to the budget shutdown and why it came up 
so suddenly out of the blue. I'm sorry, what? The budget shut down in July. The government shut down. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's just personalities. There was a fight within the Democratic Party about the speakership, mm -hmm. uh, and and that, and also the Senate, and then the governor. Um, I mean, most of those kinds of things are because people can't talk to each other, and there's something that's sliding around the table that I don't have that they do. If there was something with Blue, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Well, but yeah, but that wasn't the, the, the issue. It was, it was who was going to be in charge of deciding what to do. It, I mean, it really, I, I, I think that it, it's just one of those things that happen when people are in power. And uh, um, I just think if you have more women there, it would work better. But <laughs> yes? Yeah, it's, uh, if we get a Democratic governor elected, what do you think the prospects for the real institution of the state tax would be? Is there any chance that... I, I, th I do think that if, if Bill Murphy is uh, elected, that, that there will be uh, higher taxes on higher incomes. Would that include the state tax or just the income tax rates? Uh, it, it would be on the income tax. And the restoration of the uh, the sales tax, you know, was we. How can anybody calculate 6.85? <laughs> uh, if we didn't have fancy computers, we would have never done that. Uh, but he, he said he's going to restore it to 7%, which I don't know how much money that generates. I want to do that, uh, and I, I'm sure that he will tax the higher incomes. But not the states. I don't think that's going to come back. That's a really tricky one because of, of New Jersey being so much um, uh, out of line with the, with the federal estate tax and with with other uh, with other states. Um, you know, it, it affects a very few people, so that it was it didn't make sense to equate that with the gas tax. But uh, the estate tax, um, uh, I think that probably is one of the the, the uh, uh, reason uh, if people are leaving because of taxes and I'm not sure they are it would be that tax that very wealthy people know uh, was affecting them um, but you know it's in every 300 million is or 600 million I forget how much that was um, but that, again, that's the kind of thing that you should take into consideration and, and work that out in your plan as opposed to um, changing that and then not changing other things. It's, it's too piecemeal. We've been doing just piecemeal things for a long time. I, I think what time? I was going to say 8.30. Yes, in the back. Do you have any uh, thoughts on how the state might resolve the pension? State pension quagmire that way. Uh, there are some very thoughtful people that you know that are working on that, but I think there's there's a commitment to um, first of all they've already cut the cost of living um, increase um, uh, that, that had been guaranteed to people on their pensions, and that's it was easy to do year one, year two, year three. It it, it was a real sacrifice for people and I think they don't really realize it um, uh, I do think that um, that there's going to be a difference between the pensions and the health care guarantee because the health care is now today managed in a whole lot of places very differently than it was and um, so I think it can't continue the way it is and, and people are going to have to um, uh, deal with them, especially people who are hired new. We're going to have some changes there, but I would say even the existing agreement, it's not that you're not going to have health care, it's just going to be uh, different. But I think they're going to, uh, you know, Christy, I have to give him credit. He, um, and this has nothing to do with the, the, um, uh, the lottery that he wanted to um, sell to the pension fund uh, or give to the pension fund to increase their assets. That he uh, he did in this very tight budget put money into the pension fund uh, when when governors before him didn't do that. No, uh, I mean he 
he, he did, but when the budget went through, he put money into, not as much, but he did. And, um, and people are going to have to keep doing that. It's going to be some kind of a sacrifice somewhere along the way. I don't think that you can tell people that they can't take their pension away from them. They systematically destroyed that pension system. Not him, the long line since yeah. Christine Whitman. Systematically destroyed it. And there's been a systematic attack on state workers for having a pension at war. And hopefully Murphy will do better. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. We don't value our public servants. I mean, in New Jersey has, to a large extent, been hollowed out. I mean, Christy talks about how many people are not in state government. And when you think of the problems that we are faced with, uh, the things that they want government to do uh, that are very complicated, I mean, just, all the, the, uh, just his emphasis on opioid uh, uh, treatment and, and prevention, uh, you don't do that. Uh, by writing magazine articles, if you're really serious about that, that's a huge commitment in personnel and in facilities, and uh, and, and so that's why I said, just remember, talk to election uh, people who wants to be want to be, want to be in elective office, and ask them what they're going to do about spending the money we have, or getting more money than we do have, and then how are they going to distribute it. I mean, that's the job of, an, of our representatives. And it's not easy. I leave you with that. <laughs> right.